Welcome to the Age Reversing Blueprint Podcast, where we discuss tools and tips to help you reverse your age naturally. Several studies already demonstrated that uh, the, the high blood glucose in the blood levels of diabetics is not of dietary origin. It is mostly due to gluconeogenesis. And in fact, more than 90% of the, of the glucose present in the blood of type 2 diabetics is of non-dietary origin. Something in the body of these diabetics that's constantly causing them to, to overproduce glucose. And the question is, what is that thing? Recent studies demonstrated that this is the hormone cortisol. Cortisol is involved in both shredding the muscle mass and various other tissues because they're composed of, min of amino acids, and then sh shuttling them over to the liver where the process of gluconeogenesis deaminates these amino acids, converts them into glucose. So the body of the diabetics is what's it's causing the high blood glucose. The question is why? Well, several studies suggested that it's a perceived actually lack of glucose inside of the cell because if the cell is stuck in the Randall cycle, it oxidizes in mostly fat, Hello, everyone, and I'm really excited to introduce our next guest, Georgie Dinkoff. Uh, he probably doesn't need an introduction to you, but for those that may not know who he is, his academic training is in computer science and mathematics. However, um, due to a strange circumstances and uh, of events, um, his first job out of college was in the biochemical outfit called um, National Biomedical Research Foundation located on his campus. And um, at his job, he was one of three to four IT specialists that was tasked with developing the projects UniProt and PIR um, under the guidance of 40 to 50 top medical professionals and renowned biochemists, biochemists from places such as the NCBI, NIH, and all others. In order to better implement the project and also establish rapport with the stakeholders, he decided to embark on a self-study project in the field of bioinformatics and physiology under the strong encouragement of his supervisors hailing from the institutions mentioned above. And under their guidance, he read several medical school level intro books on biochemistry, physiology, endocrinology, while also auditing a number of biochemical class, biochemistry classes taught by those stakeholders. Thus, over the period of three years and entirely through self-study, he managed to acquire sufficient control over the health science lingo so that he could better understand the medical aspects of the IT projects and was also read scientific publications on PubMed by himself. This interest in the health topics continued and after he left his job while researching aspirin and effects on the brain circa 2011, that's when he stumbled on Ray Pete's website and articles and his ideas on bioenergetics as opposed to genetics and its control by dietary and environmental factors such as the causal health factor, disease, and even aging immediately appealed to, to um, Georgie. And since 2011, he's been doing research in that field. And this is what we're really excited to be talking about today, Georgie. So thank you so much for joining us here on this podcast today. Honored to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah, so we were having a, a, a background in conversation about what we should talk about today, and we're talking about the bioenergetic perspective. Um, what I'd like to start with, Georgie, is sort of giving your definition of what does it mean to be metabolically flexible, and then we can kind of go into how we produce energy and what goes wrong and how that impacts chronic health. Um, so the metabolic flexibility, I guess, to me, the best example is a young, healthy child. Um, basically, they will oxidize whichever one of the two major macronutrients you give them at the time, either fats or, or glucose. And of course, we can also oxidize protein, but it gets converted to glucose. So ultimately, we're oxidizing either fats or glucose. So I think everybody who's, who's been around children or has children has noticed that uh, children are, you know, uh, process food very quickly. They get hungry very quickly. They can also get tired very quickly, but they also recover much faster. Um, and let's say if you don't provide them a glucose for, for a period of time, they'll get a little crankier because they're kind of switching over to the oxidation of fat, but, but you know, the energy is still there. And then when you feed them, they, they usually try, they usually get sleepy and then they fall asleep, they recover and they wake up, they're, they're ready to go again. Uh, that's kind of the process that we're seeing start to degrade as age advances um, and 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 with, uh, towards I think late thirties maybe or even mid thirties, we're starting to see various degrees of insulin resistance in the in the general population. If they're not even if they're not for, uh, formally diabetic or have a health problem yet, in other words, there seems to be both an accumulation of extra fat, especially around the middle section, 
um, and also a tendency towards inability to properly oxidize the glucose. Um, and a lot of a lot of people interpret that as, as, oh, I just need to cut down on my glucose intake. But a child can actually handle this glucose intake without any problem. So something is happening metabolically or, or you know, maybe even genetically, as you said earlier, that is that is shifting us towards insulin resistance as we age. And there's there's been a you know a, a great debate going on for at least for at least a hundred years. What exactly is causing that? And there was a gentleman called uh, I think John Randall uh, who, who published a, a study on the so-called infamous Randall cycle, and he said uh, at at the very base there's a at the very fund at, at the fundamental level biological there's a competition between fatty acids, free fatty acids, and glucose for oxidation because they're competing for cofactors, uh, they're competing for the cellular machinery that is in the cell that basically converts all fuel that we're eating into carbon dioxide and water. Ultimately, those are the final products, and of course ATP. So if you're all, if the cell is getting a supply because the, the only thing the cell can do is whatever is being supplied to it in terms of fuel. So if you supply glucose, the cell will oxidize primarily glucose. If you supply fat, the, the cell will uh, oxidize primarily fat. If you supply both, then it then it, it depends really on two things: what's the relative amounts of each. Um, and I guess that threshold, that ratio, ideal ratio is different for, not ideal, but the ratio at which you become metabolic and flexible is different for everybody. But if you supply, let's say, a ratio of three to one fatty acids to glucose, the cell will mostly oxidize the fat. And if the glucose amounts are beyond what the cell can currently oxidize, given that it's oxidizing mostly fatty acids, then something needs to happen to the glucose. And the two pathways are, one is because the, the glucose builds up, and when it comes out of the, the 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 pathway called glycolysis, we have a buildup of pyruvate. Now, because the process of oxidation creates these uh, 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 the metabolic process creates these reduced equivalents known as NADH, NADPH, FADH2. Uh, they need to be they actually carry in the electrons, the energy from food, and they need to meet with oxygen in order to release it. And that's the whole process of combustion. Uh, when there's a buildup of these uh, reduced equivalents because the, the metabolic chain is occupied uh, by oxidizing, let's say, fatty acids, whatever reduced equivalents glucose produces have to go somewhere. And the two pathways that the cell has is one is to synthesize fats with them. But in order for that to happen, they first need to go through the Krebs cycle. But the Krebs cycle is part of the mitochondria. And when, when we see people that are um, basically stuck into oxidizing too much fat, the, uh, the, 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 the byproducts of glucose metabolism from glycolysis cannot get into the mitochondria and they start build up in the form of pyruvate and also the reduced equivalents. And the cell says, okay, I need my oxidized uh, cofactors such as NAD plus because if I if NAD plus levels drop below a critical level relative to NADH, which is the reduced equivalent, then the cell will simply die. So as an emergency oxidant, the cell uses pyruvate in order to oxidize NADH back into NAD and also FADH2 back into FAD. And in the process, it produces lactate. And we're seeing this process in, on a continuous spectrum. In other words, the levels of lactate are probably rising uh, progressively if you look at people that are progressively older. And we're also seeing that in people that are progressively sicker. So which means that whenever there is a some, some kind of a problem in the organism, um, uh, the, the, gluc the oxidation of glucose is inhibited. And when a person is relatively healthy, they don't have any official diagnosis, this usually gets diagnosed as metabolic inflexibility. So uh, they can oxidize fat perfectly fine, but if you give them glucose, they don't seem to oxidize it. They seem to waste it, quote unquote, into lactate and maybe even the synthesis of fat. And the question is, well, what's causing that? And this gentleman, Randall, said, well, there is under behind the scenes, there is, an, there is an oversupply of fatty acids. And until that thing is not, not reined in, you will never be able to oxidize glucose properly again. Uh, it also manifests as insulin resistance, right? So in young children, when you feed them the glucose after a, a long bout of fasting, the glucose lowers the levels of, of, of free fatty acids because, glu uh, I'm sorry, uh, uh, glucose leads to rising insulin. Insulin is anti-lipolytic. So eating sweet things for young children leads to a rise of insulin, which lowers lipolysis, which means less supply of fatty acids to the cell. And now the cell can oxidize glucose. That's what happens in children. That's what should happen in healthy people. In older people, that does not seem to work as well, and we call this insulin resistance. So even though a person, let's say, be needing a fatty acid meal for, let's say, 10 hours, uh, and then after that, they switch to a sugary meal or like car uh, milk high carbohydrates, 
Uh, they don't get the same lowering of lipolysis that a young person does. Um, so lipolysis, baseline lipolysis in these people with metabolic flexibility or diseases tends to be chronically elevated. Consequently, according to gentleman Randall, uh, they will not be able to properly oxidize the glucose. In other words, they will not be able to switch completely over to oxidizing glucose the way young children are. Um, and if you start looking through, uh, I mean, there's a thousand of studies on PubMed and uh, now showing that the same process, this metabolic inflexibility, but in a much more extreme form, we're seeing it in diabetes type 2, uh, we're seeing it in cancer, we're seeing it in cardiovascular disease, various neurodegenerative diseases. Uh, seem, all of them seem to be at the very base. They seem to be metabolic in origin. And the reason I say that is because they, some of these studies also try to do force the cell into metabolic flexibility, uh, usually by administering pharmacological agents that either inhibit lipolysis or block the fatty acid oxidation directly at the beta oxidation level. There's a drug called etomoxer, uh, currently used for heart disease. There's also another drug called meldonium, which inhibits the transport of fatty acids to mitochondria. All of these have the, have the, the, the end effect of limiting the supply of fats to the cell. And when you do that, even in, in, in very severe diseases, whether it's an animal or human model, the cell seems to revert back uh, to restore its metabolic flexibility. So there is there is some, I think I would say, decent evidence that gentleman Randall was, Mr. Randall was right. So there's nothing uh, structurally defective with the cell, even though that can happen, depending on how long the metabolic disturbance goes for. But, uh, you know... Um, for most cases, if you give the cell a break by uh, limiting the oversupply, because it's really oversupply, it's not the fatty acids that are problem necessarily, it's that we're oversupplying them and then the cell has to oxidize them. And then while this is happening, they cannot oxidize glucose. So, Rand so Mr. Randall is saying, if you have metabolic inflexibility, it means you're oversupplying fat to the cell, the, sat the, the cell is over oxidizing fatty acids. Uh, as for as long as that's the case, you'll be metabolically flexible and you'll be mostly oxidizing fats. If you want to restore metabolic flexibility, you have to limit the supply of fat or limit their oxidation. And several studies have already been done with that, demonstrating that at least in the cases where they looked at both animal studies and humans, this seems to be the case. Mary require high doses of these fatty acid oxidation inhibitors or beta blockers uh but it but it seems to work at least at least for the cases that have been so far so the biogenetic theory says uh, if there's metabolic inflexibility, it's due to oversupply of fat. That oversupply of fat could be due to a number of different factors. Uh, either you've already overaccumulated fat, in other words, you're obese, in which case your baseline lipolysis will be higher because you just simply carry more fat. Uh, or you're under stress because when you're under stress, especially chronic stress, uh, cortisol and adrenaline will be higher than baseline, higher than optimal. And one of the big, one of the main roles of adrenaline is to increase lipolysis. So you'll be oversupplying fats. And that's that's really a, a energy. Uh, it, there's nothing wrong with that mechanism because it was meant for us to be able to handle acute stress. The problem is when it becomes chronic stress because when you when you do when you do this for a long time, then over time you end up in this metabolic inflexibility. But Mr. Rando is saying, don't worry, nothing is damaged yet. Uh, all you have to do is uh, kind of like shock the system a little bit and switch it over, you know, help it switch over, you know, into the other direction towards oxidizing glucose. Uh, now, of course, if you stop administering these, uh, if you don't change the underlying conditions, in other words, if the person remains obese or if the person is under chronic stress, etc., when you're administering these agents that inhibit, that inhibit the oxidation or supply of fats, it's just a patchwork. It's not going to fix the underlying problem. So the underlying problem is either chronic stress, chronic inflammation, uh, which may come from many factors, but the polyunsaturated fats are, 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 very, uh, are a great source of inflammation. Um, or the person has accumulated uh, more than optimal amount of fat, and then until that is lost, uh, then, then they will be in a state of oversupplying fats to, to their cells for oxidation. Um, so that's that's pretty much in a nutshell. So it, the, these things are reversible, at least in the initial stages. Uh, they're metabolic in origin, but their ultimate cause can be a number of different things, usually having to do with chronic stress, poor diet, um, or just a or, you know or already established chronic condition uh, that basically keeps them in, keeps the HP axis activated, as you mentioned. Right. No, thank you so much for that explanation. So that's all things created equal, not considering the quality right. of the sugar, the quality of the fat. Yeah. Um, but just from a, from a, I guess, a genesis of how we got here, um, because now we're, I could see as a listener might be thinking, okay, perhaps because we vilified sugars and we've gotten into um, getting into ketosis and doing these intermittent fasting and increasing our fat intake. However, I would argue that it started before that when we vilified fat 
and yeah. we started. So maybe kind of get us to how we got here from from having this whole Randall cycle, which is saying we're preferentially or not preferentially too much demand to have to do beta oxidation. And yeah. then when you combine that with getting carbohydrates or unhealthy sugars, that creates a load on the system where the metabolic flexibility breaks down and insulin resistance ensues or it's a cat anyways kind of get us to how maybe the the evolution of how this became from when we started off with um with having f low fat diets and yeah. um, going from there um i think it started in the early 20th century um if you look at some of the older publications and how people ate back in the day they didn't worry that much about micronutrients or how much fat or sugar they were taking they were eating you know uh, according to taste um and uh, if you look at some of the older commercials from the 1940s and 50s these housewives and, and, and uh, they were geared to housewives and saying you need to feed your children at least five or six meals a day and they were eating milkshakes ice cream drinking several bottles of coke a day all of it and people were not obese back in the day at least per capita at the, at the race that we're seeing today um, something happened, I would say, in the 1950s, where I think that's when the cholesterol hypothesis started first forming, um, where basically the, uh, the, 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 I would say big pharma really started that, but uh, for whatever reason, the medical profession shifted towards limiting lipid-like molecules and started with cholesterol, saying that, yes, cholesterol, high cholesterol is associated with cardiovascular disease, and that is true, but associated uh, does not mean causative. Uh, and there have been several cases that has demonstrated that it's only oxidized cholesterol that is problematic. But oxidized cholesterol only happens when you have abnormal amount of reactive oxygen species generated. Otherwise, cholesterol by itself is absolutely crucial for the cell. It's part of the bilayer, the, the, the bilayer lipid membrane. It's the precursor to all steroids, right? So it's clearly something that the, the body definitely needs. But I think out of cholesterol grew this idea that uh, if you're eating too much fat, you will get fat. Um, and then uh, I would say around the 1960s, there was also another push to switch the saturated fats with poly to, to replace the saturated fats with polyunsaturated or monounsaturated, um, because there was another study that demonstrated that saturated fats are associated with cardiovascular disease. Even that, I think that has now, at least the latter part has been debunked. Uh, the cholesterol thing is still there, but recently FDA, not many people know, FDA changed its four decade long stance on cholesterol and said, you no longer need to worry about dietary cholesterol. It's not the dietary cholesterol that is basically uh, causative of the cardiovascular disease. Something else is happening with the cholesterol that you already have. And if you don't have it, you can actually synthesize it yourself. So we need to worry about that. Something is going on in sick people that are prone to cardiovascular disease. They have more cholesterol synthesized and also more cholesterol oxidized. And it's the oxidized cholesterol, especially 7 keto cholesterol, that's that's causing these lesions um, in, their, in their arteries. Um, so a general shift from eating um, fat rich, but saturated fat um, of animal origin um, in our diet, especially, and also a decent amount of carbs. If you look at the macronutrients in the early 20th century, they were about equal percentage wise of calories, about 30 to 33% of each. And then as the, the, the century progressed, I would say around the 1950s, there, was the, there started being a push towards lowering the amount of fat, lowering the amount of cholesterol, and then it was also in the diet. And there was also a push towards eating more polyunsaturated fats because some studies there showed, and I think that's the mechanism is true, but I don't think it's beneficial, is that polyunsaturated fats tend to lower cholesterol. Um, so so this, this campaign that, that unfolded over several decades uh, made a switch from roughly equal uh, percentage of macronutrients calorie wise and eating fat of mostly saturated animal origin to basically lowering the total amount of fat in the diet and switching uh, over towards polyunsaturated fats or, or monounsaturated but usually polyunsaturated because uh, especially corn oil because that was the cheap and widely produced oil at the time and to this day it is because it's, it's a it's a crop that's that's subsidized by the government soybean oil is another one so soybean oil and, and corn oil uh, the, uh, the the oil the oils that were heavily advertised in the 50s and 60s and 70s there were even uh, commercials called mazola your family mazola is a corn oil product sold by the gallon because it's you know that cheap uh and i think that continued and there was another crazy thing in the early 80s saying that we need to completely eliminate fat and there was this craziness about eating almost zero fat diets i would say in the 80s and early 90s and then we saw uh the opposite switch towards the atkins diet which i, I would say was in the 90s um, and now kind of like, I guess there's this confusion because everything has been tried, right? <laughs> Nothing seems to uh, effectively cure the disease. So, so everybody's uh, up, you know, up, their, up in their arms and saying, okay, so what do I do? What do I eat? Everything seems to cause disease. Everything except 
eating natural food of mostly animal, I mean, uh, eat, eating natural food in roughly equal proportions calorie-wise uh, in terms of the micronutrients and the fat mostly saturated from animal origin. Uh, that's, that's the thing that worked. If you look at the curve of cardiovascular disease, it was puny in the early 20th century compared to what it is now. Now, it's not entirely dietary. There's, I think I would say uh, these days we're also under a lot more uh, environmental stress, which ultimately translates to biochemical stress, which means we're uh, exposed way too much uh, to way too much blue light. I'm sitting in an office right now. This light above me is heavy in the blue spectrum. Multiple studies have demonstrated that blue light is toxic to the mitochondria. So at night suppresses the production of melatonin, so it interferes without sleep. Um, it's uh, There's a causal link now between exposure to blue light, even minor amounts, and type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and cancer. So if you're sleeping at night, they're saying, if you have like a watch or another device that's near you, uh, and it's got produces just a tiny little beam of blue light that you can actually see with your eye, that's already bad enough. Uh, but we're exposed on a daily basis to much more of that because we're sitting in offices with these fluorescent lights that are mostly blue spectrum, unlike the sunlight, which is heavier in the red and the orange spectrum, which, which is stimulated to the, to, to the mitochondria. Um, so, so I think we got to a point from uh, to where things were mostly working and people were going to the doctor rarely to fix a problem that was mostly of traumatic or infectious origin, not so much chronic disease, to now where we're basically mostly chronically ill, most of us, uh, and we're, we're in this precarious position. So uh, there's a, this famous analogy, health used to be, used to look like a U-curve. You're at the bottom. It's very stable. Yeah, you may swing a little bit to each side, but then with just a little bit of push, you, you, you're going to go back into the middle, which is a stable thing, and that, that's the natural position. Now health seems to be switched to the inverted U-curve. We're sitting at the very top of a very precarious position, and even a slight nudge in each direction is going to send you into the precipice. And I agree. I think that's currently that we are in this situation, but I think one of the reasons is that, well, actually multifactorial, but one of the reasons is poor diet, chronic stress, and surrounded by uh, spending too much time indoors, uh, and surrounded uh, by devices and and you know um, things that are that are stressing us out chronically. Uh, and when we're st chronically stressed out, we will be shifting the Randall cycle towards towards oxidizing mostly fat. Yeah, no, that's a great explanation. I would only add on to not so much that the sky is falling, but we have EMFs, pesticides, iron enriched foods, uh, lack of minerals in our soils. Um, which just compounds the high fructose corn syrup, mm -hmm. um, which now is no longer just what you've said, but it's all these other things that we have to contend with. So maybe that's a good segue into bringing back the importance of having a clean burning fuel mm -hmm. and not vilifying sugar as much as it has been, and maybe partitioning out why sugar versus high fructose corn syrup is potentially the preferred fuel to get you to be more metabolically flexible, which is paradoxical to what people are hearing and learning and doing. So maybe kind of enlighten us on that, Georgie. So uh, the first example that I bring to when I start arguing with people about the, the, the how bad glucose is for us, I say, when you go to a hospital and you're in a pretty precarious situation, one of the first things they're going to do is hook you up to an IV glucose drip. How can this, I mean, even if you're diabetic, <laughs> how can sugar be that bad for us if that's actually standard procedure in the ER? Um, and the second thing is that I want to bring up is that, so it's, again, it's not the sugar that's the problem. It's the fact that we're not metabolizing it properly. But the way to correct the problem is not limit glucose because the cell does need glucose, especially our brain. To this day, I don't think it's been completely resolved whether the brain can even survive long-term strictly on ketones. I know it can do it for a couple of months. I know it's been done. The ketogenic diet is used to treat, to, to bring under control treatment-resistant epilepsy. But from what I understand from doctors who are actually working in those wars, even they're saying, this is not something to be done lifetime over, over a lifetime. We, we lock these people in the ward. We give them a ketogenic diet for three months. They're always being monitored. They can get dehydrated. They can get like into nutrient deficiencies. So they're under... Uh, they're, they're heavily monitored. It's not something to do on the outside by yourself and risk it, risk it like that. So after we get them stable and they start responding to the drug, anti drug, then we stop that diet and they go back to their normal diet, which has sufficient amount of carbs. And when I ask, well, what's sufficient amount? Uh, surprisingly, they give me the answer that used to be given in the early 20th century. They're saying about 30-35% of their daily of their daily caloric, caloric intake. Um, so... Um, I think the, the 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 reason we're demonizing sugar is because we're seeing high blood glucose into the the into the the blood into the, the diabetics and many other people, especially people under stress. But several studies already demonstrated that the, that the high blood glucose in the blood levels of diabetics is not of dietary origin. 
it is mostly due to gluconeogenesis, which means that even if you, in fact, more than 90% of the, of the glucose present in the blood of type 2 diabetics is of non-dietary origin. So what this means is something in the, something in the body of these diabetics that's constantly causing them to, to overproduce glucose. And the question is, what is that thing? Recent studies demonstrated that this is the hormone cortisol. Cortisol is involved in both shredding the muscle mass and various other tissues because they're composed of amino acids, and then sh shuttling them over to the liver where the process of gluconeogenesis deaminates these amino acids, converts them into glucose. So the type, so the body of the diabetics is what's it's causing the high blood glucose. The question is why? Well, several studies suggested that it's a perceived actually lack of glucose inside of the cell, because if the cell is stuck in the Randall cycle, it oxidizes in mostly fat. It still it still wants glucose. It uses glucose for a number of different uh, in, uh, intracellular pathways, like repair, maintenance. The PARP pathway is heavily dependent on the availability of glucose. Uh, but if the glucose is not available or it's being wasted into lactate, as I said, because of over overoxidation of fatty acids, the body perceives that as a relative deficiency of glucose. It says, "Give me more." So the worst thing actually you can do in such a situation is limit the dietary glucose even more. Now. Supplying more doesn't necessarily mean you're going to fix the problem because you still have to address the fact that there's an overoxidation of fatty acids. Um, and there's some very interesting studies demonstrated that you can actually completely reverse the insulin resistance and high blood glucose of established uh, morbidly obese type 2 diabetics by administering very high doses of aspirin, 90 milligrams per kilogram daily. Uh, that that's like, I don't know, seven to nine grams daily, like for most people, absolutely yeah. massive dose. Uh, but these people, despite remaining morbidly obese, uh, biochemically, they were no longer diabetic. And the explanation, the, uh, the mechanism, proposed mechanism of action that the study authors gave was that it was with humans. Uh, number one, uh, 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 drastic decline in the inflammatory profile of these people. So that's that it, whenever there's inflammation, cortisol will rise, right? We expect that. And the second thing is that aspirin is actually acting similarly to the drug mildronate, also known as meldonium, which is a, an inhibitor of the transport of long chain fatty acids into the mitochondria. So it has the indirect effect of lowering the oxidation of fatty acids into the mitochondria. And that was all that was required. These people were already established diabetics, morbidly obese, hypertensive, cardiovascular disease, but as long as they were taking aspirin, aspirin didn't fix the problem. I'm sorry, aspirin fixed the symptom. So they were, so diabetes is a symptom. So they were no longer diabetic, but when they stopped the aspirin, went back to their normal diet, of course, morbidly obese, lipolysis is very high. They immediately went back to their, you know, hyperglycemia state. So it, it shows us that we can actually change all of this, um, at least at the symptom level, by simply helping the cell become more metabolically flexible. Now, what's the way to cure it? Well, these people are already morbidly obese. For as long as they carry this extra fat, they will all, their baseline lipolysis will always be higher. So they will naturally be shifting their cell in the Randall cycle towards the oxidation of fat. For as long as that's the case, they will not be cured. And in corroboration of that, several studies demonstrated you can cure for good type 2 diabetes if you uh, somehow cause drastic weight loss in those people. Bariatric surgery, uh, and coupling agents, et cetera, et cetera, which increase thermogenesis. Uh, in fact, these were established drugs for weight loss back in the early 20th century, but they're dangerous. They can kill you through hyperthermia, so FDA banned a lot of them. Dinitrophenol is the most famous one. So if these hyper-obese hyper type 2 diabetics lose the excess weight, their diabetes disappears, which to me is a direct proof, irrefutable, that diabetes is a fat-driven disease. It's not a sugar-driven disease. Uh, in fact, it's, it's just a fat that's causing it, and sugar is just a symptom that you have the diabetes, right? You're not oxidizing the sugar, you're converting it to lactate. Uh, recently, some studies demonstrated that uh, other another class of people which have diabetes, but be, it's a secondary disease to them, people with Cushing syndrome, and Cushing syndrome is caused by excess cortisol. Everybody with excess cortisol, with uh, officially diagnosed, diagnosed Cushing syndrome, has some degree of insulin resistance, and a good portion of them are actually type 2, diabe type two diabetics. Uh, but that study not, uh, demonstrated that if you administer a potent glucocorticoid antagonist, in other words, blocking the effects of cortisol, these people's type 2 diabetes and insulin resistance rapidly disappears. Not only do they lose the extra weight that they have, but they also get to keep it. That's really the hard part in any diet. Yeah, many people can lose the weight, but can they really keep it? And you know, without going on a very extreme, without staying on a very extreme diet. This study demonstrated that in without any change in the diet, people with already established insulin resistance and diabetes due to high cortisol were, were they were completely cured by this drug, which implies that the same process, cortisol, is involved in non-cushion-driven, non-cushion-based type 2 diabetes, which 
uh, also corroborates the recent findings that the high blood glucose in, in those people is mostly of gluconeogenic origin, which means that it's probably driven by excess cortisol. So people with type 2 diabetes are e either or and not, not mutually exclusive. They're either, they're either obese, uh, chronically stressed, or both. And if they're eating mostly polyunsaturated fats, they're also under chronic inflammation as well because these fats are the precursors to the inflammatory prostaglandins and, and leukotrienes and the thromboxanes. So I would say three major pathways here. Chronic stress, and they, they feed off of each other. Chronic stress, uh, obesity, and, and chronic inflammation. Yeah, no, that's great. So, so part of the solution as well would be to, as you mentioned, have that macronutrient ratio of 33, 33, 33. But mm -hmm. if you're chronically inflamed, potentially driving up your carbs and mostly driving down the, the fats and yeah. especially the PUFA. So yeah. maybe for people that don't understand what's PUFAs, explain to them what, what that is. So it just refers to the number of double bonds uh, on the fatty acid. The saturated fats have none. Uh, and they're very stable to oxidation, means they uh, they cannot they're not subject to radical attack, which happens in this double bond. Um, and then it's, which which is proven by you know if you have like fully saturated fats such as coconut oil, well it's actually ninety eight percent saturated, but close to fully saturated, you can leave it out in the open even under intense sunlight, and it can stay in the open for two three years. It will not go rancid uh, because it does not break down. Very very highly stable. Then you have the monounsaturated fats, which have one double bond. And there are things like oleic acid, which is mostly present in olive oil, but there are other things as well. And with olive oil, uh, if, if, if even refined olive oil, if you do the same experiment, you leave it out in the open, uh, you're probably going to get it to last for about six months uh, without any antioxidants being present, any kind of preservatives. Now, there's also the polyunsaturated fats, which have three or more double bonds. Um, and those include things like linoleic acid, linolenic acid, their, 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 their metabolite arachidonic acid, and they also the they high the, the DHEA and EPA, which are of mostly they are called omega trees. They're mostly of, of fish uh, uh, origin, marine origin, uh, and the 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 linoleic and linolenic and arachidonic. They're known as omega six. Uh, they're mostly of plant origin. So these fats are actually highly unstable. If you leave them out in the open without any preservative, within a day or two, you're going to start smelling your acidity. Uh, and this is why most of the oils sold on the market uh, include some kind of a preservative in these oils. And usually it is vitamin E. Uh, and the reason is vitamin E is actually present in, in most plants uh, to protect the plants themselves from, from these oils that are being produced. Now, the question is, why would plants produce polyunsaturated fats. It turns out, and actually this kind of shows you how good for us these fats are, the plant produces them as a defense mechanism. Polyunsaturated fats are actually toxic to most uh, life forms. And the only uh, species that is actually ad uh, adapted to eat them well and thrive on them are the ruminant animals. Uh, the, but the ruminant animals have a tricamera stomach uh, like a GI tract, and a special bacteria that lives in that in that GI tract that actually saturates these polyunsaturated fats back into saturated ones. So if you're eating, so so that's why the meat of the ruminant animals such as sheep, goat, um, uh, cows, um, uh, it contains mostly saturated fats, and the milk that they produce contains mostly saturated fats. So they're the only animals that can take a high, very high amount of polyunsaturated fats and thrive on them. All the other animals that are being given these fats, not only do they accumulate them in their tissues, but these fatty acids are also precursors to these inflammatory mediators that we mentioned earlier, the prostaglandins, the leukotrienes, the, the thromboxanes, and are also subject to spontaneous peroxidation, which means that these fatty acids get attacked by molecular oxygen in the cell, and they form highly toxic aldehydes and various other peroxidation products, many of those aldehydes are already proven to be no human carcinogens. But more importantly, recent studies demonstrated the plaque there, the, the atherosclerotic plaque that forms at the arterial wall, 80% uh, of it, 80, if not more, consists of a very specific peroxidation byproduct of linoleic, uh, linoleic acid. Uh, it's an aldehyde, and basically it's uh, for even more unsaturated than linoleic acid is. So the bottom line is saturated fats seem to be very stable. Uh, at, the, at, at the core, we're oxidation machines. So the fat, fatty acids, uh, the saturated fatty acids are very resistant to spontaneous combustion. In other words, they can only get oxidized if they go through the machinery that's in the cell that we have designed for their proper oxidation. The, the monosaturated fats are slightly less beneficial, but at least I would say they're neutral. They don't combust as, as easily as the as the PUFAs and the, and the omega-3s. 
Um, and then we have the poly and structure effects, both omega-3 and omega-6, which we can oxidize through the enzymatic pathway, but a good portion of them don't even make it to the pathway. They're so unstable that they get attacked by molecular oxygen in the cell and start forming these toxic aldehydes. And there is a chain reaction, actually, which never stops unless there's a chain breaker. And the chain breakers are known as so-called antioxidants, vitamin E, vitamin C. Uh, there are several synthetic ones already in production. BHT, I think, is one that's used in many in many foods. The bottom line is they, they they break the chain reaction of, of a polyunsaturated fat getting oxidized, producing aldehydes. These aldehydes getting reacting again with the reactive oxygen species, producing other aldehydes, attacking the, a new polyunsaturated fat, and the whole process starts again. So the whole process, uh, the whole presence of polyunsaturated fats in the body seems to basically be dangerous for us because uh, if the polyunsaturated fats are not processed, they can, they can spontaneously, not combust, but peroxidize, right? And the byproducts are toxic, universal. It's not It's not even a question here. And then even if they get oxidized, some of the enzymatic reactions, in other words, some of the some, some of the pathways through which the polyunsaturated fats can go into, such as the, uh, the cyclooxygenase and the lipoxygenase pathways, produce highly inflammatory uh, molecules, which are now known to be involved in fibrotic conditions, liver failure, kidney failure, uh, insulin resistance too. Uh, I forgot to mention that many of the fatty acids and their byproducts, but specifically the polyunsaturated ones, are actually capable of binding to the insulin receptor and blocking it. So if you if you have an excessive presence in an excessive amount of these fatty acids in your tissues, means uh, insulin is not going to it's not going to be able to do its job. So the normal reaction, which is when you ingest carbs, insulin rises and suppresses lipolysis and increases uptake of the glucose into the cell and the oxidizing glucose properly. If you have something blocking the insulin receptor, that process will not work. So you can be insulin resistant. And in fact, there's a great video I can send you later of a guy who he's perfectly healthy and lean and he tests, he uh, checks his blood, 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 blood glucose regularly. I think it's in the 80s. And then he chugs um, like a, a glass of olive oil or, or like a, a corn oil. I think it was a corn oil. Within 30 minutes, his, his blood glucose is already registering to the hundreds, which is pre-diabetic. And I think he managed to get it to the diabetic level, which is, I think, above, uh, above 125. I think it's the cutoff currently. Uh, and then as he slowly metabolized the fat, his blood glucose slowly dropped and basically returned to normal. So to me, this is a great example that, that, that insulin resistance and ultimately diabetes is driven by these fats. It's just that in the already diabetic people, instead of chugging one glass, these people have some have an endogenous continuous supply of these fats. And for as long as that's the case, their blood glucose will stay elevated above normal. Right. No, that's excellent information. So obviously eliminating polyunsaturated fats is the key having a as much of a stress-free life as you can possibly make. <laughs> All right, I hope you're getting a lot of value out of today's podcast with Georgie and how we're talking about the Randall cycle and how we talk about a broken metabolic flexibility challenge in someone who is not able to burn carbs and not able to burn fat because of too much stress in their life, too much cortisol release, which Jordy has talked about in terms of that is responsible for gluconeogenesis, which means you're putting more glucose on the assembly line to have to be processed combined with either the excess body weight from the adipose tissue and fat or even too much fat in the diet or too much PUFAs. And what I wanted to suggest is supporting cortisol can be very, very helpful. And we have two major project products that we recommend. We have the Cell Recom AM and we also have the Cell Recom PM. And what happens is cortisol is known to uh, to create more glucose demands, gluconeogenic. And when your body 11 beta HSD is upregulating up the production of cortisol because of stress, that's putting too much load on your system. So we formulated both of these products, Cell Renew AM uh, and Cell Renew PM, which is used to modulate that extra production of cortisol from the 11 beta HSD enzyme, the main ingredient being Hinocchio or magnolia bark and we are selling this you'll get a special discount for listening to this podcast and be able to purchase the cell renew am and pm am can be used at night it just has a, a lower concentration of the hinocchio bark and is less calming or less fatiguing when you take it at night when it's a stronger dose so now back to our interview i guess my question well just as an aside um, choline is a really important nutrient for so many things. 
And when you have someone who's a vegan and they're not eating animal foods, and potentially when I look at genomics, they're they're weak on PEMT and certain other uh, enzymes. Um, I guess I got into a little bit of a, a, a tussle with a patient of mine because one of the suggestions I was having them recommend was a lecithin um, non-GMO from like a, a safflower or sunflower. Um, I guess the question on the air is, is that uh, considered a seed oil that's going to create an inflammatory reaction in their body or are they getting more benefit out of the choline that they're taking from that supplement? I think it's better to take choline uh, if you find phosphatidylcholine in a saturated form. Um, uh, there's uh, this thing called uh, palmitoyl phosphatidylcholine. So it's a palmitic acid bound, bound to choline. There's also steroid phosphatidylcholine, ste steric acid bound to, to uh, choline. So these things are very hard to find in isolated form, but, it, but you can get them from organ meats. Uh, one of the highest concentrations of these uh, saturated phosphatidylcholines is actually present in hearts of ruminant animals. So, if what, you do, what do vegans do though if they're vegan? Uh, then I don't know. I think they're they, they're out of. I mean, they are luck. They have to take some kind of a choline supplement. Um, well, but you don't see. think that the the safflower or the sunflower is worth the polyunsaturated exposure because it, of that? It depends on the amount. So let's say if you're eating like a couple hundred milligrams daily, which I think it should be sufficient to cover the choline requirements, then I think it's, it's safe. Uh, there are supplements on the market that use safflower oil as a solvent uh, for various fat soluble vitamins. And I know people who've been taking them for years, they've measured their, their inflammatory profile, nothing has changed for the worse. So I think it depends. It's like the dose that makes the poison here. If you're right. doing gr a gram or more, uh, so which which so, so a portion of that is choline, so it's not all polyunsaturated fats. But I'll say a gram or two grams or more a day is probably a problem. Bodybuilders that take multi-gram doses of choline daily, if they're doing the safflower oil-based one, I think that will be a problem. But a gram or under a gram is probably fine. Right. I know. I appreciate that because I when I was researching for today, I said I got to make sure I ask you this because. I do think that the ends have to justify the means if you're not getting it. But at the same time, you have to be aware of you don't want to have it's it's the dosage for sure. So so getting into um, into glucose testing, I know that's a pretty big vogue in in, in vogue these days. Um, and they have um, continual glucose monitors and there's also blood glucose ketone machines. I guess the first question I wanted to ask you was before with those kids that are metabolically flexible and they can burn beta oxidation effectively and then they can go into glycolysis and um, burning glucose effectively. When you have someone who's metabolically flexible and you take their ketone levels with a blood meter, are they going to be necessarily in ketosis or does it mean that they won't be? I, I guess that's the question. Well, I think ketosis is already extreme. Like you must have been like uh, in a complete lack of glucose availability for several days. Uh, so when you get into those metabolic wards to get on the ketogenic diet, they put you on the completely glucose-free diet, right? Uh, and then they measure your ketone body levels, but they don't rise until day or three or four. Uh, to the point where you're actually officially in ketosis. Now, if you buy the urine uh, ketone body monitoring strips, you will register some level of ketones if you limit glucose, but I don't think it'll be full-blown ketosis uh, right. because it, initially gluconeogenesis will kick in and then you're going to be supplying some level of glucose. Right. Uh, Let so, me rephrase. Sorry, okay. rephrase the question. Mildly ketogenic. So like maybe 0.5 millimoles on a okay. blood meter. Would that be something that you would expect to see someone who's not necessarily trying to eat in a ketogenic way, but they're metabolically healthy. Their Randall cycle isn't competing for each other. They're not getting polyunsaturated oils. Would you expect to see a mildly ketogenic marker to see if they are actually meta? Is ketones in a mildly ketogenic number uh, uh, evidence of being metabolically flexible? Yes, yes. And also in addition to that, if uh, what happens if they ingest, let's say, a sweet drink? Would the ketone levels drop? If they drop, to me, that's the biggest sign that they are that they are metabolically flexible. That they are metabolically yeah. flexible. If they're right. if they don't drop, then that's a problem. Right. And then and then I've heard on another podcast, which I think a lot of longevity experts don't understand because they haven't there's no science to back this um, is, that oh, you can't have any spikes. And maybe you can talk about that, Georgie, in terms of when you are metabolically flexible, when you're limiting your macros to an equivalent ratio, mm -hmm. especially if you don't have a metabolic disease and your metal, your polyunsaturated fats are, are not being ingested um, and you're not eating high fructose corn syrup. 
um, what would a profile look? I mean, it's obviously unique to every individual, but maybe you could dispel the fact that it doesn't have to have a spike or it, it can have a spike and what we see with, with that. Um, as far as spiking, let's say in terms of uh, blood, blood, blood glucose and insulin, I think is a marker of actually healthy pancreatic function. If you ingest, let's say, a, a, a drink of pure glucose, which is the most insulinogenic, uh, I think that's the test they give to uh, to pregnant women for gestational diabetes. They like make the oral, drink, glu uh, yeah, oral glucose, right. oral glucose test for seventy five grams of pure glucose, and then they measure both their blood glucose and their insulin levels. And I think they insert a the cannula, so they take several measurements over a couple of hours. So you have to stay there while this is going on obviously uh, and i think what they want to see is basically a, a parallel and and proportional rise of both so you want to see both the blood glucose levels rise together with insulin and then you want both of these to decline steadily over the next couple hours when one or the other is out of whack that's usually not a good sign right if you have a, a high uh, 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 rise high spike uh, a very very high spike of glucose but not of insulin then they start worrying about insulin resistance or potentially even type 1 diabetes uh, if you have the other thing basically uh, releasing too much insulin but th that's a high glucose load so you're expected to, to make more insulin uh they're more worried if you don't produce enough insulin uh relative to the glucose to the glucose load and of course that's their first worry the second worry is how fast the glucose declines after that um so i would i would prefer to see spike in both and also a rapid decline afterwards of both um a, a less ideal situation would be uh basically rising both but then prolonged uh, uh long time takes for the glucose and the yeah, insulin to drop glucose, right? right yeah uh and then the worst i think to me the worst situation is basically there's a spike in glucose and not enough insulin produced uh, uh several studies came out risk to show that if the if this response of insulin to glucose is is sufficiently blunted in other words if you're really and you're not type 1 diabetic then there is usually some kind of a tumor either in the pancreas or in the surrounding area. Um, and I think most often they said it's people that, that, that are about to be diagnosed with something called men's type one or two, multiple endocrine, uh, neuro, it's a, it's a, it's a tumor of right. the, of the enteric nervous system, basically. Right. Uh, so you want to be, you want to be able to respond to glucose with the production of insulin. That's the first step. Second, you want the cells to be able to, to see that signal, right. To be insulin sensitive, uptake all of that glucose and quickly metabolize it, which leads to the, to the drop in blood glucose. Um, so, so I'm not afraid of spikes. I'm afraid of if only one spikes or the other, right. And then also how long it takes for the, for the blood glucose to disappear. Yeah. So with, with that being said, then are you in favor of the, of the new uh, Vogue for people to get these glucose monitors to, to monitor their, their metabolic health? Um, I think it can help, but it can also lead to a bit of an orthorexia, like people checking their blood glucose like every hour or so. Like if they're continuous, if there's some kind of a patch, I think now they have it for diabetics where you basically attach this device and it's got these micro needles, right? And it can check your blood glucose levels continuously. I think that there is, you know, it can be useful. Uh, but to me, the, the glycated hemoglobin is usually good enough unless you're already sick. So if you're in generally good health, your, your glycated hemoglobin is actually a, a good indication. Now, interestingly enough, uh, it, a lot of people uh, think that the glycated hemoglobin mostly is mostly driven by the average blood glucose level concentrations over the last six, three to six months, right? Turns out that it's actually fats that contribute more than glucose, especially polyunsaturated fats. Several studies demonstrated if you give people with high HbA1c, uh, if you give them uh, antioxidants such as alpha tocopherol, which prevents the formation of advanced glycation end products and also prevents the, per, the, the or limits the, the peroxidation of polyunsaturated fats, the, the glycated hemoglobin declines despite no change in glucose intake. So once again, it shows you that even when you were dealing with blood glucose, the underlying cause has a lot more to do with fat and its peroxidation and the inflammation that that causes uh, than the actual supply of glucose. Oh, another study showed that take, uh, giving people with high HbA1c aspirin also leads to the decline of, uh, of that biomarker. Um, so, uh, and again, aspirin, anti-inflammatory, classic, you know, this is a classic mechanism, but it's also an anti uh, fatty acid oxidation agent as well. Not as potent as meldonium or etomoxer, but still enough to cause, uh, you know, 10 to 15% drop in HbA1c, which doctors love to see. Um, right. So yeah, so I think HbA1c is good enough as a start. 
if you don't have an already established problem. And if you do, then I think the, the continuous glucose monitor, which which is con truly continuous instead of you having to prick your finger like every couple hours, I think that the, the, the foreign one is better. If you have to prick your fingers too often, that can create a stress reaction. Uh, and in fact, it can raise your blood glucose levels <laughs> above what, what we open. It can scare you, even though it's simply a reaction to the stress because cortisol rose. And whenever cortisol rises, blood glucose rises. Right. Yeah, I can see how, because I, with some of the patients that I work with, we supply them with a blood glucose ketone machine, and I want to see some of their reactions and if they're mildly ketogenic, but it can create a dual comp, you know, a competition between making sure that they're getting fats and then trying to control their carbs. And then they're in that metabolic purgatory range where they can't get into, into uh, either, I guess, yeah. Um I, I guess the question or the shift now would be, okay, so, so far you just mentioned alpha tocopherols. Is that um, suggested or oh, above and beyond just a mixed uh, vitamin E tocopherols? Um, what's your, what's your feedback on that? I think all of them, uh, all of the four isomers are fine. The problem, uh, recent studies have, see, have shown that alpha tocopherol has the highest affinity for the tocopherol transfer protein, which is the one that's carrying it around the body to, in distributing to tissues. So, so, even if you take mixed tocopherols, most of that of what will be absorbed and stored will be the alpha tocopherol isomer. The other three seem to be excreted much more rapidly, um, but they do have the same anti antioxidant potential. So a good uh, you know mix of tocopherols without the presence of, of much polyunsaturated fats, because most of them are uh, most of these most of the tocopherols are extracted from soybean oil or sunflower oil, safflower oil. So as long as it's the more mostly pure tocopherols, then I wouldn't worry too much about the, the like the the actual uh, uh, composition of the of the mixture. Uh, you can try getting pure alpha tocopherol, but more often than not, the isolated isomers are, are synthetic origin, and very often they have contamination with heavy metals and, and other things that are less than desirable. So, you know, if you can find a good mix tocopherol of natural origins without too much polyunsaturated fats in it, I will go for that. Right, great. And then you mentioned aspirin, and I know you've talked with Dr. Mercola about the difference between acetyl and acylicic um, uh, and, and willow bark. Um, maybe you can give us some insight on that. So uh, aspirin is simply uh, uh, two, uh, I'm sorry, two acetyl, uh, two, two acetoxy salicylic acid in the body that quickly metabolizes into an acid, acetyl group and pure salicylic acid. And most of the prometabolic anti-lipolytic um, you know, uncoupling effects of aspirin are actually due to salicylic acid. It's just the acetyl group, which I think it has an anti-fever effect and a platelet anti-platelet aggregation effect. Uh, and a lot of people that are taking aspirin uh, simply as a blood thinner, I think they, they, they may want to go with aspirin. But as far as it's most of the other prometabolic effects, inhibiting the oxidation of fat, et cetera, et cetera, play salicylic acid, which is the major metabolite of aspirin, should do just, 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 as, just as fine. So willow bark is great. It's perhaps the, the oldest drug in existence. I think there are references in the, uh, the Egyptians using it up to 3,000 years before uh, BC. Um, so it's a great thing. It's just make sure that, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's a decent product, you know, just like anything else. If it's an herbal extract, uh, um, it, it has tendency to contain, you know, some kind of toxic residue solvent in it. Um, and then, uh, you know, that could be the problem. But as far as salicylic acid, I don't have a problem with using salicylic acid compared to aspirin, unless you're looking specifically for the blood thinning effect. Right. So the with the willow bark, is there a percentage that's uh, the extract that you're looking for or a, a total dosage amount that's suggested? So I think between 10 and 20 percent is is uh, is probably the max you should be looking for, because anything above that, in order for them to get the ex extract standardized for such a high concentration of salicylic acid, they have to use more and more complex process and potentially more toxic solvents. Um, and first of all, it will be more expensive. It should be. If it's not, then it, I think that will be a sign that something nefarious about this specific product. But 10 to 20% is probably fine because for the metabolic effects of salicylic acid, you just need a couple of hundred milligrams daily. Um, so if, let's say, there's like a, if it's been sold in pills that are 500 milligrams each and you're taking two of those pills, I mean, if it's 20, 10 to 20%, then it's probably okay. That's probably should be enough. 
um, uh, these these studies that have been done with salicylic acid aspirin with very very high doses in the grams range uh, in the early 20th century, more recently for diabetes, um, these are uh, you know extreme doses which I wouldn't administer. Uh, I wouldn't do self medication with that. Now, if a doctor approves it and a doctor is willing to monitor your uh, uh, thrombin time, prothrombin time, in other words, how likely you are to bleed to death. Then, then it may be worth doing it, but there are probably safer ways uh, to achieve that, to achieve these effects. Um, caffeine is a great uncoupler. So if you want to raise your metabolism, you can do that, right? Um, uh, progesterone is a great uncoupler. Salt is actually very thermogenic. Protein is highly thermogenic. So there are lots of safer dietary ways to achieve what is being done with aspirin salicylic acid. Uh, and if you want to take the aspirin salicylic acid, a couple hundred milligrams of daily are, are probably fine. Um, and you can control bleeding risks with things like vitamin K, which is also available over the counter. Right. And when you say uncoupling, Georgie, you're talking about the 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 Randall cycle that is preferentially doing beta oxidation. Is that what you mean by uncoupling? No, uncoupling meaning that it's a it's basically a coupling in a, it uncouples the, the 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 production of ATP from the flow of electrons. So in other words, you generate a lot more heat per unit of substrate oxidized instead right. of ATP. So so things like dinitrophenol, which is a, a uncoupling agent, basically you produce less ATP, but a lot more heat. So, and, and, and so which means you can eat a tremendous amount of food, but you're gonna, you're gonna dis dissipate most of it as heat. And the risk of course, with that is that there is no break on that process. You can uncouple yourself to the point of raising your temperature to unphysiological, potentially lethal levels. So aspirin is an uncoupler, but not to the level where it can kill you just like dinitrophenol can. Uh, it still can kill you if you take, there is, there is salicylate poisoning. People have attempted suicide with it, but we're talking about 10 to 15 to 20 grams in a single dose. And, you know, I, 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 unless somebody's really trying to kill themselves, I don't think it's, it's likely for people to end up in the situation. So a mild uncoupler like aspirin, especially combined with another moderate uncoupler like caffeine. In fact, there is a study showing that caffeine can achieve the exact same amounts of uncoupling as dinitrophenol, but you have to take, again, higher doses. But a combination of milder doses like a, a 100 to 200 milligrams aspirin, 100 to 200 milligrams caffeine, it looks great. Uh, it raises your basal metabolic rate by about 10 to 15%. And the good news is this elevation stays for at least 10 to 12 hours. So you can right. do it once or twice a day and it should be fine. Right. And that's a whole other rabbit hole I would love to interview you with because in terms of the cytochrome C oxidase and bioavailable copper and more exhaust coming out of the electron complex. And I guess just this in this uncoupling method, it's creating more heat, which is driving your metabolic activity, which is ultimately burning nutrients or or in a in a in a non-exhaust producing way. Is that is that accurate? That, that's accurate. In fact, children, which are fat, known as fast oxidizers and very metabolically flexible, they produce a lot more heat than we do. In fact, they're they're moderately uncoupled compared to us, the adults. And this process actually declines with age. Uh, and one of the explanations that the bioenergetic theory gives is that whether that's adaptive or, or pathological, that, that remains to be seen. But one of the reasons for our declining temperature and declining uncoupling level is the decline of synthesis of T3, the active thyroid hormone. Uh, whether we produce less or we convert less, uh, it's it's a separate story. But it's indisputable that our the the, the, the core body temperature drops with aging, um, and you know that that you know the higher the temperature in general, the higher the basal metabolic rate, the more calories you can burn without getting yourself into exercise or, or you know or right. other. Um, yeah. It's funny. It brings back sort of memories when I was an exerciser in my early twenties. There was a triple stack. I don't think you can get it anymore, but. It was the white willow bark. It was the caffeine, and it was the ephedra. Ephedra, yep, yep, yep yeah, yep. yeah. They 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 ban ephedra, but you can still get the. I think they 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 replaced ephedra now with something called yohimbine, which is like yep. an extract right. from an African plant. But right. you can still get aspirin, um, caffeine, and and yohimbine. I don't think it works as well as the as the as the ephedra component. Maybe that's why they banned it. They realized it's a, it's way yeah. too good as a weight loss drug. Yeah. So, so one of the questions that I had, which, which is maybe a bit of a rabbit hole, but the other supplement or the nutrient you talked about was niacinamide. Mm -hmm. And I, I do have a patient that I work with that um, when I showed you the DNA, um, she has some major challenges in synthesis and utilization of, of NAD. Um, but maybe talk about the utility of niacinamide, but also the bell-shaped curve of it, it inhibits its own production. Yeah. Um, that can leave you in sort of a limbo area. So let's let's talk about that. 
So niacinamide uh, probably its most important role is as a precursor to NAD+, uh, which is the oxidized cofactor, which is necessary for pretty much all of the reactions, the, step, the, the steps of the uh, Krebs cycle and the, and the uh, electron transport chain. Um, so without sufficient amounts of NAD, the cell dies, which, the, which is why the cell takes uh, extreme precaution into not letting NAD levels drop. And one of the ways, one of the emergency mechanisms which you mentioned earlier is that if you have a deficiency of NAD+, which usually means an excess of NADH, which is the reduced equivalent, the cell will do everything it can to oxidize NADH back into NAD+, and the emergency oxidant, because it cannot get, it cannot directly use oxygen, an emergency oxidant is another oxidizing agent that can accept electrons. In the case of the NADH and NAD+, that's pyruvate which is a byproduct of the, which is the output of the glycolysis cycle. But the problem with that is, you, you know, when you're using pyruvate as an oxidant, you're creating lactate. So anyways, NAD plus, it shows you what an extremely important molecule NAD plus is for the cell. Um, and it's been shown conclusively now that, that the rates of NAD plus and the total uh, nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide pool, which means NADH, NADP, NADPH, the total uh, um, nucleo, nicotinamide adenine nucleotide pool declines with aging. Uh, and also it's low in, in, in various chronic diseases, especially diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and cancer. Um, and there, so the question naturally is, okay, so if, if we assume that this decline is pathological, what can we do to raise it back, right? To increase the total pool and specifically the oxidized uh, portions of that pool. Well, one way is to take a precursor and niacinamide, uh, as, well, as well as niacin and uh, and also something called nicotinamide riboside and another one called nicotinamide mononucleotide. All of these are precursors to NAD+. However, they have to undergo several steps in order to get converted to NAD+. And the, I think the crucial, the rate limiting uh, step of the process, the enzyme is known as NAMPT. Uh, and that NAMPT enzyme has a very uh, quirky requirements. If you give it too much, and by too much, it, how much is too much is unique to each person, just as you demonstrated with that uh, genetic analysis of that specific person. Um, then then this, this, the activity of this enzyme gets inhibited. So you're going to get a buildup of niacinamide, which is not always good because the body has to process it somehow. And one of the ways to reach the body process is that it, it methylates it. It converts it to something called 6-methyl uh, uh, nicotinamide. So this means that ex higher doses of niacinamide are methyl 6. They're methyl depleters. Uh, now, in some people, there is excess methylation, so you can argue that for them, niacinamide, exonacinamide will be good, but for others, there's deficiency. They're deficient methylated, so you have to be very careful with them. So in other words, you have to find your sweet spot if your goal is to raise NAD+. You have to find the sweet spot for niacinamide, and you better not exceed it, <laughs> because then you're going to be inhibiting NA NAMPT, and it takes, I think, a couple hours for this block to actually be, be removed. Uh, so you're going to be in real problem for a couple hours, probably feeling quite crappy if you take too much. And uh, for most people, I, I think based on experiment and what I've read in all the literature and animal studies, the sweet spot for raising NAD plus without interfering with anything else seems to be between 50 and 100 milligrams of niacinamide per dose. Um, in some people, that's enough for the entire day. In others, uh, you may, they may need to take this dosage several times daily. But, you know, I think it's better to err on the side of safety. So I would say 50 milligrams three times daily is probably safer, safe for most people, safer uh, uh, in terms of inhibiting NAMPT. Uh, right. If you take 500 milligrams or more, you will definitely be in NAMPT inhibition territory. So, so it's a problem. Uh, is there anything else that can be done to help without these risks? And I think the answer is yes. Just as the body can directly oxidize NADH and all of the other reduced equivalents back into the oxidized equivalents, um, you can take other oxidizing agents and achieve the same process without taking niacinamide. Uh, now, if your total pool of the N of the nicotinamide adenine dinucleotides is low, then you, you, you would need a precursor you, because the only way to raise the pool is to take a precursor. But if you have enough of the pool, but it's simply shifted towards ox, uh, towards reduction, in other words, not enough of the oxidized equivalents, what you can do is take an oxidizing agent. Metal in blue is one oxidizing agent. Uh, various other quinones, such as vitamin K, uh, emodin, which is found in cascara, the tetracycline antibiotics, um, and there's several other, like a, even hydrogen peroxide would be able to, to basically oxidize some of those reduced uh, nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide derivatives back into the oxidized version. So maybe ideally it would be a combination of low-dose niacinamide and an oxidizing agent. Uh, and I think a, a study, I, I read a rat study somewhere um, 
couple of years ago showed that the combination of low dose niacinamide and the human equivalent of about 10 milligrams of methylene blue uh, uh, increased the NAD plus levels by I think seven to eight hundred percent, but each one of them taken on its own was only it only increased about by about 150. So highly synergistic effect. Uh, and I think that's the best way to go. Low doses of things that attack the pathway from different angles is better than higher doses of each one of them specifically. Right. So maybe that, thank you. Very, very helpful. So with this particular individual as well, that there's a fine line with, you, you know, too much, too little, but then adding more complexity to the issues, they're very um, genetically weak on their methylation. So mm -hmm. would your suggestion be to be able to add um, a, an oxidizing agent like, um, or in the sense of more methyl support while they're doing that, like TMG, choline, or... Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think TMG will be fine. Uh, and also, like, if they have a problem with methylation, then then I would probably skip the niacinamide for now. Just uh, try the oxidizing agent on its own. Uh, if that improves the situation, yes, you're not going to get the seven to eight hundred percent increase in NAD plus, but maybe you don't need to. Maybe all you need to do is basically, if their total pool is sufficient, then all you need to do is shift it back to to oxidation. Um, uh, because you know, again, you got to be. We have to be careful with giving a person in that state uh, too high of a dose of niacinamide. Uh, and we don't know how much of a choline or TMG uh, would be enough to offset the, the, the methylation depleting effects of niacinamide. Uh, is it one to one? You know, is it two to one? Um, I don't know of any studies that have done that. Um, I mean, we, we, we can make some calculations, but I, I would rather play it safe. First, try the thing that is not likely to hurt, which is the oxidizing agent on its own. And only if that doesn't work, then try to play with niacinamide and, and choline and, and other methyl donors. That's interesting. Thank you so much. I mean, I'm getting and maybe part two will be because um, I, I would love to talk to you about actual testing in terms of what your feeling is on omega quant testing and looking at leukotrienes, prostaglandins, um, cortisol to DHEA. I'm really interested right. to talk to you about that or cortisol to testosterone. Mm -hmm. um, the way that people get in contact with you is the website H-A-I-D-U-T dot me. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. Hey, hey, dot me. Hey, is my alias on the, which I post online. Okay, perfect. All right. Well, listen, I, I enjoy your, your knowledge. I can tap into so much more. Um, I always like to ask my guests, because this is a longevity path uh, podcast, um, what do you know now that you wish you would have maybe known earlier in your in your journey, Georgie, that would have been helpful for understanding or prolonging your own longevity had you had a head start with that? A uh, couple of things. Number one, chronic stress. Do not underestimate it. It kills. Uh, and it can get you in a situation which I myself experienced where uh, even the best doctors in the world, and they clearly they're good doctors, they, they don't mean any harm. Uh, they cannot do much for you simply because you're you're already a wreck. You don't get yourself into a, to be a wreck, even if you're making tons of money. There's some things that, uh, even with our advanced knowledge these days, uh, it will be very difficult to reverse. Thankfully, I didn't get to that point, but I know people who did get into that point, uh, and they regretted not listening to their body earlier. So chronic stress, especially if you feel like oh you're always you know in a fight or flight reaction, you can't sleep properly, you're, you're agitated, irritated at everything. That that is a good example. I mean, maybe psychiatrists will tell you you're depressed, but before even that sets in, I would say it's a sign that you're under chronic stress if you're lashing out at the world constantly. Uh, number two, diet. Um, I wish I had known about the polyunsaturated fats earlier. Uh, there, there have been some, you know, I've known, I've heard little bits and pieces since I was a very little child. I remember when I was growing up in, I'm originally from Bulgaria, it was still a communist country. There was this great debate on the radio because they were saying, well, the Western science shows that, you know, we need to eat more seed oils and all these animal oils, they're, uh, they're after it clogging. So they were fighting about whether that's true or not. That was one of the first things. But at the time, I didn't know anything about that. So, you know, you just do whatever you're told. Um, uh, so avoidance of polyunsaturated fats and avoidance of many toxins that are present in foods and seem benign by names. Things like silicon dioxide, titanium dioxide, talc, uh, carrageenan. Uh, it's even approved in organic foods, but actually in several countries, it's banned as a known colon carcinogen. So, so things that seem very benign and even if they're organic origin can really wreck your health. And they're very nefarious because they're, they're on the label, but they're in very tiny amounts. 
and no doctor will suspect them. I mean, it will take decades before they, before the publications that are available now make their, you know, the kind of seep into the into clinical practice. So definitely pay attention to the label and what you're eating. You are what you eat, as the saying goes, right? So that's it, number two. Number three is knowing about aspirin earlier uh, and how important it is to help. So it's not just an inflammatory molecule. There is a reason why the Egyptians used it widely. Um, you know, what is it? Uh, 5,000 years ago. And in fact, they would always place a little bit of willow bark into the tombs of their mummified pharaohs to help them stay healthy on the other side. Uh, so now, we're now finding out that, that aspirin has a number of different properties that are that they have that they go way beyond inflammation. It happens to be the main stress resistant agent that plants produce. At anything that attacks the plant, whether it's a uh, whether it's a pathogen or an herbivore, or even somebody kicked the plant and injured it, immediately the pathways are activated to synthesize salicylic acid, and it makes the plant very very resistant to subsequent damage and helps it heal. The same process seems to be activated by aspirin in mammals. Uh, so you know, unless you unless you have a medical reason not to use aspirin, I would consider it, especially now that there is evidence that aspirin is a great longevity booster. A study with yeast. And several other animal studies in the yeast was the most dramatic effect, demonstrating that a human equivalent of about a gram of aspirin daily increased maximum lifespan, not average, maximum lifespan by 420 percent. Um, caffeine increases, increase, uh, also demonstrated to increase lifespan. Pro-metabolic things in general and avoiding stress seem to be the best way, and of course, being mindful of your diet, seem to be the best way of, of, of um, uh, increasing longevity and lowering stress and making life more enjoyable because I think it's not only making, not, not, not just putting more years into life, but also putting more life into the years uh, and avoiding stress and being mindful of what you eat and being surrounded by healthy, like-minded people. I think it goes, it, it goes a long way towards achieving that. It does. I mean, it can get real complicated really quickly, but the solution is is always common sense, just back to yeah. nature, food, thy medicine, and yep. and but but it's a lot harder to achieve because of the adulteration and what we've done to our environment to to be able to do the easy stuff. But listen, you're a wealth of information. I appreciate your knowledge, and I definitely want to be able to tap into it another time and get into biomarkers and you know hand strength and. Uh, FE2, you know, different different things that you can look at that are not just the traditional medical biomarkers or the analytes, but now these things that show that studies correlate higher with longevity that are more functional based than than you know treating through take this pill or that pill and get right. this number lower or higher. So awesome yeah. information. Uh, anything else you wanted to add there, Georgie? No, thanks a lot for inviting me. I'm you know really honored to be here. Thank you so much. Hi, thank you so much for watching our Age Reversing Blueprint podcast. If you've made it this far, we sincerely thank you for your attention and your interest in reversing your age. If you're looking to get more information on today's topic or other podcasts that we've had, be sure to check out the show notes and be sure to check out drjoelrosen.com. Have an awesome day.